first I want a disclaimer. I'm not with any organization. I mean, these brochures were given to me when I went to testify. I'm just an individual citizen, and I'm just here because I want to present what the bill is about. A lot of people don't know what the bill is about. They just say, oh, well, it's assisted suicide, end of subject. They don't know the stop gaps. They think that you're going to be coerced by your relatives, that if you're a burden, that you're going to commit suicide because, because your relatives want you dead or they want to inherit and you don't want to spend any more of their money. And so House Bill 119, Death with Dignity, is a stringent bill. They have watered it down from Oregon's bill, they said, watered it down. It was presented by Dan Zwanitzer three weeks ago. I went to testify on my own because I have strong <coughs> feelings about this subject. It's my life and it's my choice is the way I feel about it. I don't want to have to be a medical refugee and have to go to another state if I'm terminal. I don't want to have to go and, and die someplace else. I want to die in my home, in my state, in my own bed. My choice. And so this bill first states that you have to make an oral request to the doctor. You're found at your terminal. You go to the doctor. You make a formal request. You go home. You wait <coughs> 15 days. Then you have to go back to the doctor, make that request again. At that time, he has to tell you all of your options that you have. You have to write a letter stating that you want assisted suicide. You want this medication that is going to end your life sooner because you're terminal. You don't want to wait till the grisly end. So at this time, the letter that you write has to be witnessed by two people. <coughs> Neither of those two can have anything to gain. They cannot be on your will. They cannot gain in any way to be a witness. They have to state that you are of undue stress, that you're not being coerced into this, you're of sound mind in their eye, and they have to be over 18 years old. You have to have been a resident in the state for at least a year to even make this request. At that time, the doctor again says you can rescind your request, he tells you your options again, then um, he sends you to another doctor for confirmation that you're terminal. They go over all your records. The doctor has to write you a letter of what your condition is, that it is terminal, and that he is give you, giving you an estimated time of how long you have. It's not that it's in stone, that you only have 30 days to live, so you feel rushed. You feel like, oh my gosh, I have to end it now. He can only give you a, a guess, a guesstimate of when it's going to happen. And at that point, you um, go home after he is, you've gone to the second doctor, you've discussed it with them, they have clarified that yes it is true, <coughs> they have found you of sound mind, he can even send you to a psychiatrist if he wants to, if he doesn't think that you're of sound mind. So it's, it's up to your doctor's discretion, if it's a psychiatrist or if it's just another doctor. Anyway, so you have to go through two doctors, at least, before you can make this end of life decision. Then you go home, he has to wait four days. At that time, he can prescribe the medication. He will call the pharmacy with that prescription, and then, it's up to the pharmacy as to whether they want to prescribe it or not. So you need to make sure with your doctor, and the doctor can deny giving it to you. So if this is what you decided, if it became a law in the state, that doctor can decline, so you need to make sure that you have a doctor that is in, in agreement. Then when it gets to the pharmacy, you have to make sure that the pharmacy is in agreement because they can say no, they're not going to fill that prescription, it's against their beliefs. So you have all these stop gaps. You have to administer the medication yourself. No one can give it to you. They can go pick it up for you, but they cannot give it to you. And you don't have to take it. 
you can stick it in the drawer and decide that you want to go to hospice in the end, that you've changed your mind. You do not have to take it. At the end, when you have received your medication, you then, um, the doctor has to send in a form to the state stating that you did this. And if you do not take the medication, they collect the medication. You just can't keep it in your drawer for the next person to decide that they want to use it. So there are stop gaps, and, and it's also to ensure that somebody else doesn't use the medication, somebody else doesn't decide that they want you to die. I mean, there are all kinds of stop gaps in this. So what they found at the end was there were, um, there were two people testifying for and two people testifying against. They decided to put it into a study to study the word wording. Now, it also says in this bill that if you decide to do this and you're terminal, <coughs> your insurance, your life insurance, will not be null and void. It's still valid. You were terminal. You were going to die anyway. So they cannot say that they won't pay on that because you killed yourself. And um, the doctor cannot be held liable. It also states that in the bill, that if he, if he should decide to give you this medication, that he won't be held liable for murder in the end. So I just wanted to read some of these things. They have done several studies in Oregon to see how it affected people, if it affected. And it says, of the total of 752 who died as a result of the medication, slightly more were men, 52.7%. Over half fell into the age ranges of 65 to 74, and 75 to 84, 27.4%. The overwhelming majority was white, 97.3%. Most were either married, 46.2%, or widowed, 22.8%. It also said, in total, 1,173 people have received the prescriptions for life-ending medication under the DWDA, and 752 have died from ingesting the medication. So not everybody takes it. Then it went on to say that 99% were enrolled in hospice at the time of their death, and more than 98% were covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. People dying of cancer dominated the group at 78.9%. And then it said the data collected 56 Oregonians interested in dying, aid in dying, of 29 potential reasons they listed, that's very important, for wanting to control the circumstances of death, wanting to die at home, the loss of independence, the fear of future poor quality of life, future pain, and future inability to care for themselves. And this, this medication, that would be ingested by you. Unconsciousness and death usually occur rapidly after ingestion of the medication, which is a large dose of fast-acting barbiturates. And it said that the median time that it takes to die is five minutes. So you need to say your goodbyes before that. And I purchased the film, the DVD, um, How to Die in Oregon. It was a very good documentary about dying in Oregon and very peaceful. He had a chance to have his family around him. He had a chance to get his life in order before that and he ingested the medication and he died peacefully and the cameras pulled back before he actually died. But it was very fast acting. Oregonians who received life-ending prescriptions, 34 who requested a prescription did not receive it, 63 who did not pursue aid in dying. They found that those receiving aid in dying prescriptions had higher quality ratings on items measuring symptom control and higher ratings on items related to preparedness for death than those who did not pursue aid, pursue aid in dying or who began but did not complete a request. The authors report that aid in dying may meet the goal of relieving worries about future discomfort, pain, loss of control, and request was not a reflection of poor care. So, of those things, I also wanted to tell you about 
why I felt, now of the states that have this already, there's Montana, Vermont, Oregon, Washington, Canada just recently passed it. They're trying to pass it in Colorado and they're trying to pass it in Wyoming. Um, the things I want to tell you about our personal life of why we believe in death with dignity or compassionate choices, whichever. There are two organizations. I donate to Compassion and Choices. Now, one of the ladies that was there to testify in Cheyenne was with the Catholic Diocese, and there was the religious aspect. I believe, I am a religious person also, and I believe that you can die without it being a sin. I don't honestly think that a loving God would want you to suffer to the very end just to prove whatever, I don't know. I mean, you're already terminal. It's just that you're choosing not to go to the last days, that, that it's going to happen. And so with us, it was my husband's father. He had emphysema for 17 years and he was suffocating. He had gotten to the point where he couldn't even walk 20 steps out the back door to his little shop to work anymore. He had no breath to do it. So he was just sitting in his chair every day, suffocating. And he did not want to wait until he could get his last breath. So he went into the spare bedroom and he shot himself at 2 o'clock in the morning. We didn't have a chance to say goodbye to him. We didn't have a chance to tell him how much we loved him. And we understood that he didn't want to wait for that last breath. And we had to clean up the aftermath. We had to paint the wall that was stained. We couldn't get the blood off. I had to scrub the carpet with, with pieces of skull flying out of the carpet. And I wish so much that we could have told him that we understood that he didn't want to go to the end. And, and then my husband's niece died six weeks ago of breast cancer. She went to hospice for her last month, and she wasted away, and she was in excruciating pain. And that's what her husband has for his image for the rest of his life, of what she looked like at the very end. And we had a friend who died at hospice here in Casper. We went every day for six weeks to sit with him until he died. And that left his 84-year-old wife owing $10,000 to hospice. Now, they always say, oh, hospice, you have hospice. You know, why do you need death with dignity? You have hospice. Well, it's not free. And I went to hospice and talked to them and asked them what their charges were. They pay for the supplies. Uh, Medicare pays for the supplies. They pay for the nurses, but they do not pay for the room and board, which is $250 a day. So our friend was $10,000 in debt at the age of 85. You know, I mean, that's quite an awesome responsibility to realize that one minute you're debt free, and the next minute you not only have lost your spouse, but you're in debt again. And I just, I think that any of you that believe in this, that you really need to take part in telling how you feel about this to your legislators. And I'm not here to argue with people, and there are people that have their religious convictions, and, and I'm not trying to change their convictions. I'm saying that why should your belief trump my belief when it's my life? It should be my choice. And that's all I have to say. Well said. Could I make a comment? Um, my husband has been gone for five years, and he was in hospice. We did not pay a penny. Where were you? Right here in town. Well, and I think uh, my husband just died, just September. We did not pay a dime. No, they there are there are rules and regulations. If if the doctor says that they cannot be released from hospice and go home any time during this, then they'll cover everything, uh, as I understood. They told me that. Um, with my husband's condition, I think they had different levels of charges that Medicare pays, but they said his care was a thousand dollars and um, a day, I think, yeah. and uh, Medicare paid everything. 
Well, and I did not have to file that. any papers or anything. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to hospice? <coughs> I did. I just about. talked to them three weeks ago. Okay. Well, maybe no, it's I'm changed. Well, That's what I know. Joe had railroad. Railroad. I don't think he had. He had railroad pension. His pension stopped when he died, and so she had nothing to. You know, she had no. Well, maybe that's mm -hmm. that could be an issue. I just want to say that <coughs> for us, there wasn't any yeah. You mentioned some of the other states that have similar um, laws on the books. Yes. Is is this House Bill 19? Is that a 119? Is it modeled after any of the other ones, or are they all the same? Or it's kind of modeled after Oregon's, but Dan said himself that ours was a watered-down version, and I don't know how he meant that because it seems pretty stringent to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. all the all the do's and don'ts that you have to go through before anything is done. Well, and, okay. Has it been read before the House yet? Um, it was, read, up yet? it was read before the committee when they decided to put it into the study. I testified in front of um, six the committee. people, yeah. the committee, yes. And has the committee released it to the floor yet? According no. to the, what I got off the internet yesterday, it's uh, not active any longer. It never did get introduced to the House. It didn't. So it died in committee? So it, no, it, they didn't. it didn't kill it. No pun intended. No, <laughs> no. It didn't kill it, they just put it into a study. Okay. Yeah. So it, yeah. it, it, it it's not a possibility of it being uh, passed in this until we are reduced two years from now okay. in this session. This is future planning. Right. Okay. Now we also lived in Oregon before we moved here, yes. knowing what was going to happen. And family was here, so we moved from the beautiful coast <laughs> to windy Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> But I know in the Oregon thing at the time when we lived there, and the people did like it very much, except the religious concept. But um, no, never mind. It's a difficult subject, it really is. Never mind. Well, and I, I have two different things. I, I look at what abortion did to the the doctors that were delivering babies, and I do know one doctor in Casper, and he had the courage when he started doing abortions to reject all of his patients that were not wanting abortion. So I wonder what you think this is doing to the hypocritical or the doctors when it's their position to do everything <coughs> in their power to maintain life and keep you as comfortable as possible. They have a choice, and I have talked to doctors that are for it. So there are those that are for it, those that aren't. So if, if I, as a person that believes in death with dignity, want to do that if I am terminal, then I will find a doctor who believes in it. My choice. Did you get a sense from the committee members as you testified what they felt about it? I mean, um, when I spoke, they, they seemed sympathetic to it. When the Catholic Diocese lady spoke, she was very angry. And she was so angry that she, she practically attacked them. You know, I mean, she said when they said, you know, you've talked for a long time, we need time to let other people talk. She said, well, I gave you this before the meeting. I assume you all can read. You could just see them all back up. <laughs> She was very angry for some reason, and everyone felt that, that she was very angry. And there was one person that was against it, uh, of the legislators. He said, well, I have a story that this man was in a coma, and he came out of the coma, and he's, he's eating on his own now. And so, you know, what's considered terminal might not be, but I guess it would be what's considered terminal. Then someone at the other end of the panel said, uh, I am for it, and if it comes up, I will vote for it, because he said, I am speaking on behalf of a friend, and I wish it had been in place. And there were people that called Dan in Cheyenne before this all took place and said, know that I am for it, because I just lost my spouse, and I wish they had been in place, or I'm about to lose my spouse, I wish it was in place already or the person themselves that said, I am dying and I wish it was in place because I don't have an option of going to Oregon right now. It's too late. And so, has, has the medical profession or have, have 
the pharmacists, have they um, weighed in on this at all? That I don't know. They didn't discuss that. Like I said, I'm just a citizen. I, sure. I don't have all the facts, and I'm not with an organization that maybe would have more facts. I mean, I was given these magazines, and um, and I went because of how my feelings are about this bill. I think um, the idea of pain and terminal are like two different things. People can be terminal and still comfortable at home. Not, not every terminal patient is in terrible pain. Right. So I think that if the bill passes, and I think like they did in Oregon, mm -hmm. a lot of it, they pushed pain more so than just terminal. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. when the pain is so severe and they can't do anything about it, that's when this kind of comes into play. But if I were <coughs> terminal, but feeling reasonably well, Mm -hmm. then maybe I wouldn't want to do that. Right, and that but would be it's the choice. It depends on your quality choice. of life. Mm -hmm. Pain would really... Well, now, that's already in effect, though. The, the post uh, permit form is in effect uh, uh, right here in Wyoming at the present time. Uh, you, can, you can sign the form, and you and your doctor, and, and uh, sign the form and that you will not be... Uh, Life sustained, mm -hmm. you only be treated for pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Yes, e even to the point where through Dr. Works, as you well know, yeah. mm -hmm. you don't even have to take antibiotics if you have yeah. pneumonia. Right. In fact, when Bill was at uh, Life Care, the, the police or the firemen came and they were, he had had a stroke and they were going to cut his shirt and do the mm -hmm. yeah. procedures to keep him going and we said hey King's X this is not what we choose right. Mm -hmm. right. we want comfort care <laughs> well then the hospitals yeah. have do not resuscitate well you have to have more than that that yeah. that is not detailed enough and that's yeah. why I was it's asking only, you Dr. Works yeah from that. Mm -hmm. it, it's we've very got those right across the hall here if you want to study mm -hmm. into those mm -hmm. it's so Go ahead. Go ahead. Even with a bladder infection, which most of them get, they will not treat bladder infection except to keep you comfortable mm -hmm. because uh, that's a way of letting you die in comfort without doing these procedures that they can't even kill prisoners with. So yeah. I'm wondering how this is going to work all the time. Yeah. For yeah, exactly. I think, I think if the pharmacies are not releasing drugs to the state to for death penalty issues, I think it may be difficult to get those drugs. Mm -hmm. Because if it's easy to get those drugs, the state has got to stop this idea they can't find drugs to... to uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think the pharmacies are going to be a major issue. And that's it. that's a, a another one of their oaths, too. That's not why they're educated, yeah. to kill people. How does Oregon get them? That's a great question. I think it'll answer different drugs. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's not a barbiturate. Do you know, Alicia, if, if someone would like to weigh in on this pro or con, what would you suggest would be the best way for them to do that? I don't know. I took it upon myself to just, um, I called Compassion and Choices. I looked it up on the internet, mm -hmm. got their number, called them, and said, you know, what can I do to help? And and they said, well, you can go testify, which is way out of my own. <laughs> I am, sure. Like I said, I am sure. not a public speaker. I'm scared to death standing up in front of people, and especially when there's protocol. I mean, they told me at the last minute, you have to say, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, you have to go through all of this that I was, it was thrown on me at the last minute. Your Majesty. I was <laughs> terrified. Yes, I was absolutely terrified. But like I said, I have such strong convictions about it that I overrode my own feelings to do this. And so I would recommend that they um, find out what legislators they might know. I mean, there's uh, Scott, there's, I mean, I run into certain people around here and if there's anyone you know, or if there's, uh, if you look it up on the internet, get some names and telephone numbers. That's what I did. I didn't know Dan Swanitz or from anything, and I just looked it up on the internet to find out what his telephone number was and his email, and started emailing him. And 
I know they're very busy, but I just felt like if there was something that I could do, sometimes you just have to go out of your comfort zone to live your convictions. Well, as of now, we're just waiting for this study committee to say something? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They were going to study the wording because they, they didn't there's, like all the wording, like when it said that There's a complete bill right here. Yeah. It okay. came off the internet yesterday. Right. And like they were saying, you know, um, the doctor wouldn't be held responsible and things like this. I mean, they didn't like some of the wording in it, and so they just wanted to study the wording. And, uh, it was better than killing it. That's what they told me. It was better than just killing the bill. At least they put it into a study. But I just think that they're not sure how Wyomingites will react. I mean, there are those in Wyoming that would say, I believe in the old way, it's my life, it's my choice. And then there are people that would say, oh, it's a sin, you're going to go to hell if you do this. And so, you know, I mean, you've got so many factions that they have to, um, I guess they just have to decide to either take the lead on this and see how people feel about it. I don't know. Choices. 